Welcome to Booked, where two guys tell you about the books they're reading. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. The book we're going to be talking about this episode is End of the Ocean by Matthew McBride, a book that we have been looking forward to since uh, uh, we even knew that it was going to happen. Um, real quick quick bio for Matthew McBride. He is the author of A Swollen Red Sun and the cult classic Frank Sinatra in a Blender. Originally from rural Missouri, he now lives in California. Five stars for that uh, for that bio. The last the time way. we reviewed a book of his, um, it his bio still had all of like the places that his short stories had been published. Oh, and so it was like two paragraphs of just like beat to a pulp and in all those different like you know crime things, and and so he mm-hmm. really cleaned he cleaned it up for now that he's got a couple of novels. That's an interesting point. Let's talk about that for a second. Is that like a sign that you've arrived where you stopped dropping like where your short stories were published? That's that's the feeling I get from it. Um, like huh. when when your only bona fides are short stories, you have to like beef up the list, I think. Sure. But yeah. when you've dropped a couple of novels, I feel like then you can just stand on the, you know, the weight of that. Uh, that's my like impression. At some point. At some point, Tom Hanks had to stop putting down Bosom Buddies. Uh, yeah. Like in his bio. <laughs> it's so funny you mentioned Tom Hanks. I think I posted something about the burbs the other night. Tom Hanks has been on my mind lately. Well, I mean, if you're going to have an actor on your mind, that's not a bad one to have. Absolutely. Matthew McBride um, has also become one of those authors where, like, if he puts out a book, we're going to review it. We don't need to know anything about it. We talk about this from time to time, right? He's, like, on the pre-approved list. So, like, a year from now or whatever, when he's got another book coming out, we're going to review it here. I think that's pretty much a foregone conclusion from um, what we thought of Frank Sinatra and a Blender and a Swollen Red Sun, which we reviewed both of here on this podcast. Here is the synopsis for The End of the Ocean. From the author of the popular cult classics, Frank Sinatra in a Blender and a Swollen Red Sun comes a riveting novel of redemption and suspense that asks the question, just how far are you willing to go for love? Would you give up everything you've ever known? Risk your freedom? Risk your life? When newly divorced Sage arrives in Bali, his only plan is to drink on the beach until his money runs out and then return home to start over. So he's caught by surprise when he falls in love with the country and its people, particularly the attractive and considerate Ratri. Soon Sage can no longer see himself living anywhere else, even as his funds dwindle and his visa's expiration date nears. Increasingly desperate to stay with Ratri, Sage finds himself being recruited by a drug smuggling ring in a country where drug trafficking is punishable by death. The promised payout would be enough to set Sage and Ratri up for life, but only if Sage isn't caught. Will Sage go home and risk the life he envisions with Ratri, or risk everything to stay and make that life possible? Both lyrical and suspenseful, intimate and ambitious end of the ocean is an unforgettable look at a brutal business in one of the most beautiful places on earth. I think I have some gripes with the synopsis. (laughs) Is it that the synopsis repeats what books he's written? No, 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 not at all. So I had not read the synopsis, you know, like basically I said at the top of this podcast, really it doesn't matter what Matthew McBride, he could, he could write an article in a hunting and fishing magazine. Right. And we'd read it. Um, I think it gives away too much. Like I felt that I liked it on, like I kind of got where it was going. I mean, you know, we talk about this obviously through the course, but I think this takes us too far into the book for a synopsis. The whole being recruited by drug trafficking. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll give you that. Um, I actually, uh, midway through the book went and checked out the synopsis just to see like, what it revealed and it did kind of set me up for like, okay, I see where this is going a little bit more than I did before. Um, but it didn't, it didn't do anything to hurt my impression of the book. No, no I don't know. I guess that's the thing, man. I just like the stories to unfold <laughs> yeah. on their own. So I, I guess any synopsis that takes me past like page 30 is just too much for me. Like, you know, so I guess that's Which what I'm is saying. weird. Cause like we, we reveal, I guess we do a pretty good job of like keeping the story intact so that the 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 important parts are still uh, have their their full impact. I, I think we try to do that. Yeah. Well, there are those podcasts we feel like 
saw we could talk about, and I'm thinking, yeah, we made it 45 pages in. <laughs> yeah. That's where we're done. Then we'll talk about some characters and maybe a couple of inc- you know incidents in the book or, or whatever. But yeah, so um, I'll let you get started with this one. So the uh, the book starts out with uh, the protagonist. His name is Sage, um, uh, on a beach, uh, sitting in a chair, um, with a beer, just kind of reflecting on a beach in Bali. Pardon me. Um, reflecting on, he can't believe he's here. This is not something he'd ever expected, you know, his life to be like. Um, because, but what brought him here was the fact that he was recently divorced from his wife, who uh, was stepping out on him, and so his whole life um, had fallen down around him. And he decided that a trip to Bali was kind of his way of hitting the reset button. And so the story starts out with that kind of perspective of this is why he's here. And then he starts to reflect a little bit on some recent things. And, and before he's, we, we are introduced to Bali. And one of the big things that happens at the very beginning is he's reflecting on his, his plane, his flight to Bali and his uh, very, I'm trying to think of the best word to, to describe the, the guy that he was sitting next to on the plane, Wayne tender is one of the big, characters in this book and he's just this like over the top i don't know why but i i imagined him wearing a cowboy hat but he's this austria <laughs> you know what i'm saying he's just this yeah. australian um kind of larger than life character yeah boisterous for sure can i say that i love it when you say stepping out and it's like the <laughs> old timiest thing that you say like you're usually right on the cutting edge of mm-hmm. whatever the current lingo is but then yeah. you come out with a stepping out which i think maybe <laughs> was used in the 40s uh, i don't know why i like the way that that sounds uh, it, it, i mean definitely before you were born sure is absolutely. when people were saying like oh he was stepping out on her probably around the uh, sinner man like La- lawrence block they would have said yeah, that in that book for, for sure absolutely <laughs> so yeah, so we're introduced to Wayne in these kind of uh, flashbacks initially from Sage about conversations they had in the airplane, as Rob mentioned, completely over the top. Um, Xboxer, you know, he's got a penis the size of his arm, like that kind of guy. When you first said Xboxer, I thought you meant like he played the Xbox, but you oh, meant like no. he's a former boxer. Right? Correct, yes, former boxer. <laughs> I guess that former does sound better. Xboxer. Huh, what yeah, I think about Xboxer. that. Xboxer. Um, so, but yeah, we're introduced uh, a little bit to Bali, but Wayne is definitely the, um, not just the antagonist in this book, but he takes up almost half of the book as we see things, not just from Sage's point of view, but in kind of alternating chapters, um, we see things from Wayne's point of view. And he has come there to um, complete some transactions which involve smuggling. So through Wayne, we're introduced to his kind of network of people that are involved like he's kind of a hands-off guy he sets everything up he gets all the people in place and then he collects uh, money from whoever it is that's employing him to smuggle said product uh, into bali uh word of note um drug smuggling obviously is taken seriously here in the united states but in bali it is punishable by death like they don't fuck around with drugs at all. Um, you know, through through the course of the book, we're introduced to uh, a prison, which sounds like one of the foulest places on earth. You know, twenty men to a cell with one hole in the floor to use the washroom. That that kind of thing. Um, so it, it's definitely not something you want to get caught doing anywhere, but even less so in the country of Bali. Like to the point where, up to the current day, if you are sentenced to death it's a freaking firing squad like they're mm-hmm. not they're not messing around but yeah um no. so on the the sage side of the story um because he is our main character and, and he's obviously the one that we are um sympathi- sympathizing with and seeing the the world through even though we do like livia said have um like kind of per- uh perspective shifts uh, on the sage side, he is just completely naive uh, going into this trip and just in awe of, of what's going on around him, more or less. Uh, but at the same time, kind of dealing with very, very, you know, heavy heartache and just like probably like one of the lowest moments in his life. So it, it, there's a lot of emotion on the side of sage, um, either just 
wonder and awe uh, at the place and the people that he's with, or just really heavy emotions based on the fact that he lost everything that he ever loved. Um, but I think it's more the wonder and awe. So er early on, one of the people that he meets um, just kind of helps him get situated with some stuff and, and, and uh, in the course of, I think it's the first part of the book. Um, he meets this person, this like, so I would say within the first 25 percent or so he is invited to join that person and his family for like uh, a very significant uh, religious holiday kind of thing where they visit different temples and pray and he goes to his family the family's house and, and eats food and everything and this is stuff that's entirely foreign to sage so to be able to experience these kinds types of things intimately with like a family he just met and like learning about their culture to him was like a big um, significant kind of thing in his life. I think that was really cool um, in the book. So this book is as much, I think about Bali as it is about Sage's journey. Yeah. Like, I don't know. You, know, you read about or you hear about or whatever, like other cultures doing things and you go, okay, yeah. All right. They go to the temple. They pray at a bunch of temples. All right, whatever. But I think that being able to see it firsthand and doing something like that with someone definitely would put a completely different spin on it. Okay, try to put myself in Sage's place because they had talked about this holiday and how they go to all these temples. And, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I mean, that's cool that they do that, but it wasn't, so it didn't sound at all interesting to me personally. But then as Sage is going along with them, I'm like, man, that would be really cool though. Like, I would welcome the opportunity. Like, I don't want to hear about it. It doesn't sound that interesting. But if I had a chance to go, like, how much cooler would that be to learn about that culture? by being taken through it, not watching a YouTube video or reading about it in a book or, or whatnot. So I thought that was, that was pretty cool and a great way to introduce us, the readers um, to an important holiday. Uh, we're not being purposely obtuse. It's just hard for us to pronounce some of these things. So we'll call it an important <laughs> holiday, but uh, I thought that was really <laughs> neat. And any time that we touched on the, the Balinese culture and, and there's a lot of it in this book, even the difference in like language between like the three different languages that are spoken in that area and stuff, all of it was, was great stuff. Yeah. And that it, it, the, this book kind of highlights something that I, I always think of when I travel, when I, you know, have the opportunity to travel is that I never want that tour bus taking photos experience of something. Cause it feels so surface level. Like I want to be on the ground doing it like they do it. Um, as much as possible. And that's definitely Sage in this book is lucky enough to kind of with, with the relationships that he builds with people, you know, go through life as if he's one of like the population, not like he's some tourist who's just, you know, getting scammed and just seeing the surface of things. So I thought that was pretty cool. That'd be me. I'd be getting scammed. <laughs> you're on the tour, but you're on that, like, what yeah. is that thing in, uh, like in Boston where it's like the amphibious car or yep. whatever. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Getting scammed. All right. Um, that um, scene that we just talked about is really where Sage develops this fascination for a uh, Rotary, which I hope I'm saying right. Rotary. That's, Rotary. that's what I was reading it as. Yep. Yeah. Um, she's the cousin. And, and one of the reasons that Sage really wants to go is he's invited. He's like, oh, hey, what's up with your cousin? And he's like, yeah, she's going to be coming praying to temples with us. You should come with. And he's like, all right. And, you know, he uh, I'm not giving anything away because it's in the in the synopsis. But, I mean, he starts to develop uh, affection for her, which grows through the course of the book. On the flip side of that, Wayne's shit um, is, uh, <laughs> you know, is... Uh, He's uh he's doing his thing. He also has a lady friend that he's uh kind of infatuated with, uh, but uh, things are starting to go a little sour on his side. Like he's got a big big smuggling thing going down, but people are getting cold feet. And one of the reasons is, and now we transition over to real life, is uh, the Bali Nine are expected to be put to, uh, or at least a couple of them are expected to be put to death any day now, which is really heightening the um like awareness of drug trafficking and stuff so there are people getting cold feet on going through with wayne's next big um operation which is problematic for wayne yeah so this book uh in addition to just really exposing the balinese culture actually is kind of centered around a 
a real life thing, which is the the Bali nine. And uh, to take it like a, a layer deeper, uh, Matthew McBride's own personal experience. So he went to Bali um, around, I want to say 2015 ish, um, 15, 16, whenever that was. Actually, I can look. I think it's 15 because that's when two of the biggest names in the Bali Nine were executed. Yeah, April 29th, 2015 is when they were executed. So he must have been there, I'm guessing, around that time or maybe late 2014, early 2015. So he was there when this was going on. The Bali Nine were originally uh, arrested for smuggling in 2005. So it's like 10 years they've been in prison and these people are starting to be executed. And McBride was in Bali when... um, these the two the two most um kind of you know recognizable names or whatever the nine people Mm -hmm. were about to be executed and so he matt mcbride went to the prison they were being held at and tried to i think he was tried or was successful in interviewing um some of the people and so he is pulling all of the bali nine stuff and the smuggling stuff comes straight from his personal experience because he was there. He learned a lot about it and he was very like personally invested in exposing what was going on and, and obviously the injustices and stuff like that. Um, a lot of this book, if you read into the, um, the afterword and the, the thank you section, I guess um, a lot of this is drawn from real experience. Now I don't know what kind of drug smuggling Matthew McBride was doing, um, but he kind of details the the being on that holiday and visiting temples with somebody, uh, which I thought was super cool. And, and and I got that feeling, you know, when you're reading it and just because I know he was there, I, I felt that there were things that were authentic, the, the kind of thing yep. you wouldn't think to make up for your story, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a we have quite a bit um, of authenticity in this book, not just in the Bali nine, but from someone who spent a significant amount of time in, in Bali. Um, the only other thing before we get way too far into the story is to say that um, Sage does encounter Wayne again and, and they kind of become friends and they spend a lot of time hanging out, getting drunk, getting high. Um, and quite honestly, I mean, I'm, we're going to talk about this in spoiler talk. My favorite part of the book is there is a chapter where Sage gets high unbeknownst to him. He has slipped something. <laughs> um, and that is some of the funniest stuff I have read since um, Apathy and Other Small Victories. Um, I want to make a note because you said the funny part of it. Uh, in the two previous books that we've reviewed, Frank Sinatra in a Blender and A Soul in Red Sun, more so Frank Sinatra in a Blender, um, the humor of Matthew McBride was probably one of the bigger topics that we we spoke about and uh i, I want to say that this is different um while there are humorous moments like what livius just mentioned i feel like this was much more serious than the other work and i feel like that was very intentional that being said it was still inter- entertaining and um yeah, it just had a different feel to it because because it was really like seeing through Sage's eyes, and so you 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 had that kind of um, uh, empathy to the vulnerability of the character and the emotionality of the character and everything like that. So, not as entertaining, but that doesn't mean that he didn't find a way to work humor into it uh, in in a very classic Matthew McBride kind of way. Yeah, I, there were interactions with locals too, yeah. like. I would say like misunderstanding. There's one part where they're talking about drinking something. The person says to him like, well, sometimes it's going to make you go blind. And he's like, what? <laughs> what do you mean? something? Good? Like, what are you saying? And he's like, they're like, yeah, sometimes so he's like, why do people drink it? Like, cause it's cheap and it, it works. Yep. Like it's just it could make you go <laughs> blind is beautiful. Beautiful warning for liquor. Yeah. Um, there are, there are a few other characters really um, outside of Sage and Rotri and Wayne. Um, it's really that the rest of the characters are either uh, people were introduced to very briefly or they're part of the smuggling ring where we learn a little more um, in depth about how these uh, how these things work. So it's a little bit of a how to guide on smuggling. Um, but that's uh, that's essentially it. Anybody else we're introduced to is really kind of a passing um, character. You know, someone uh, that McBride likely met while he was there. <laughs> right. So. So the cast of characters isn't uh, of significant characters is fairly small, I guess is what I'm trying to say. 
one thing I was just reminded of. Uh, so one thing I want to point out is is a little bit about the the drug smuggling thing, and I'm going to assume that there is at least some reality to this. Um, they don't call the drug smugglers mules; they call them horses. Mm-hmm. And um, the whole <laughs> like is funny because um, you've got some of the the horses, I guess, or people who are a part of the ring. Uh, f- at different points in the book, reflecting back on when they became a smuggler and how they were kind of uh, emboldened. Uh, and one of the things was talking about, like, look at you got you got your you got such big balls. Look at the balls on you. You can do this kind of thing. And then that comes back later on when like someone else is um, getting kind of encouraged to be a, a horse. And the, look at the balls. You got such big balls. And it just came back multiple times in a way where it's like it became funny because um, all the sincerity was stripped out of it because it was just the thing that they knew would push someone over the edge to say yes to, to being a, a mule, basically. And I, it was just so humorous. I would just kept, kept coming up in this like formulaic way um, to get people to decide to do something that they could die for. Yeah, it's an interesting... Um... It's an interesting thing. I was watching something on television recently. Um, one of these like uh, airport border security kind of shows. And it was all about the episode I watched was all about people smuggling drugs mm-hmm. and watching like, like the different reactions um, that, that they had. You know, one was a woman and she just I have no idea how that got there, you know. I bought that <laughs> suitcase, you know what I mean? But I mean, just really in the other ones who immediately kind of cave in after they're found out, you know what I mean? So there, there's some different ways to go about it. None of those people had really big balls though. And yeah. nobody probably told them they did, or maybe they would have done better than they did. But it was, uh, it was interesting to, to see that in action. Yeah. Um, what? Uh, and then to read it in this book and, and kind of have I, I just saw it recently. It was this like it was when I was in Europe. I was watching it one night on French TV um, in English. But, you know, so to just a month later, see these people, I, was, I had visions of, you know, of what I had watched and how that played into these particular characters. Yeah. And one thing that in talking about this, I feel like we didn't do was talk about why smuggling um, was so attractive to people when it obviously could cost you your life or life in one of the worst prisons you could possibly imagine is that it's not a super like aside from like the people who are the tourists that are there and the people who probably profit heavily off the tourists it's not a rich country and so the money you make doing one smuggling run you know could pay for a lot for you and your family so yeah yeah there's a big incentive to it's it's a huge it's it would be like you know not something you could retire off of but one run you're living comfortably with your family for a year or two years or whatever it is yep at one point um there are two bodyguards that are are hired and they're paid eight dollars each for the day yeah. To give you an idea of how inexpensive it is to, um, you know, to, to do things in Bali. As a matter of fact, um, Sage at one point tells Ratri that, you know, like a good cheeseburger is $10 in the United States. And she basically loses her mind thinking about the fact that somebody pays that much money for a, for a hamburger. Yep. You know, because for her, that's probably days and days of food for her family. Yep. And it's something that, you know, we throw away on, on lunch. Um, obviously here that money is not uh, a significant, nearly as significant an, am- an amount of money, but, uh, yeah, what Rob's saying is true. You make one, one run and you could be living, you know, either high on the hog, like a lot of these characters do where, you know, they come back and all they do is party and, you know, put Coke in their nose, or you could be like other characters in this book that are squirreling it away in hopes that, uh, one day they could work, um, a lot less or retire earlier, provide for their, their family and their children. Yeah, and that's that's emphasized very well. So he does a good job of presenting like the bare facts in a way where you really understand what the stakes are and um, why these people are making those choices. So I felt it was necessary for us to at least kind of do that too. That's fair. 
we are going to do spoiler talk for this book, um, yeah. mostly mostly for us, because I want to hear Rob's take on uh, on how this book turns out. So, uh, for uh, again, for anybody that's not familiar, patreon.com slash booked is where you can help support this podcast by donating as little as $1 a month. For that $1 a month, you'll get access to um, a spoiler talk, which we do occasionally on books that merit um, some talk about things that we can't talk about here. If you plan on reading The End of the Ocean, I strongly urge you not to go listen to Spoiler Talk until after you've done so. Um, But we're going to go do that, and uh, we'll be back momentarily. All right, we are back from Spoiler Talk, where surprisingly we talked about koalas having syphilis, which is actually chlamydia. Right. So so if you want to understand what Rob's talking about, (laughs) become a donor for as little as $1 a month, and you'll be able to listen to that Spoiler Talk, where koalas have chlamydia. I don't know what happened. <laughs> Beyond that, we actually did have some cool spoiler talk about um, not only the ending and, and our thoughts on that, but also some of the like more lighthearted, fun stuff that we weren't able to talk about in the regular review. I would like to kick off the wrap up, if that's yeah. okay with you. Do All it. right. So um, I really liked Matthew McBride's previous works. So I was, I thought this is going to be pretty easy to really like this one. And man, I got sucked in from like page three with this shit from Bali. Um, it was super cool to learn about the Balinese. Um, it was super cool to get a little uh, closer look than I've had at drug smuggling operations <clears throat> and how people handle uh, those types of things in other countries, as far as, you know, the, the law and, and stuff like that. And it had a really solid story. It had a character that was relatable. Um, And and even Wayne, um, you know, at first Wayne kind of came off as someone you didn't like, but it didn't take too long into the book for you to be like, oh, this guy's not that bad. And then shit blows up. So you get the the action. And I will tell you, I did not expect this book to keep me guessing like it did, but it kept me guessing. And that was a little unexpected. Um, Super well written. Uh, a ton of fun, uh, a good education on Bali and, and Taiwan to a certain extent, too. This was, a, this was a super enjoyable book. Five stars. Yeah. like Olivia said it before. Anything McBride, we're going to read regardless because um, so far he's got a sterling record with the stuff he's written. Not only his novels, but, you know, the short stories that we've encountered as well. Um, so I was excited to get this, uh, get my hands on this and... One thing I'm going to point out at the beginning of my wrap-up is um, I re-listened to our reviews of the other books and our interview with Matt, which took place, oh my god, uh, five years ago now or something like that. And one thing he said uh, in in the interview was he said something to the effect of, I'd rather write 10 completely different books than 100 books that are the same. And at the time, you know, I probably didn't think much of it, but... uh, Frank Sinatra in a Blender, very different from A Swollen Red Sun. Both of those very different from End of the Ocean. End of the Ocean, um, while it does have kind of a criminal, uh, you know, theme running through it, is very much a book about a guy who who broke his heart and is trying to live again, and um, uh, and and it, it's very, it's it's emotional and it's uh, I don't know like. It, it, the sage character and what he goes through, um, is just very real, and and it's something that I really enjoyed seeing. And on top of that, then having the true story of the Bali Nine tied in with all of the introduction to the culture of of Bali and the surrounding islands and everything like that, all wonderfully done. The criminal element was necessary because this was a story based around um, the consequences of smuggling. And uh, that was pulled off greatly. I think that was very interesting. I think the characters were developed as much as we needed them to be in order to get us to an ending I never suspected. Never expected, I should say. Um, there were some really cool twists uh, in the story, like I said, that I never saw coming. And, man, like... Uh, I it's a five star book. Can't believe that McBride brought us something entirely different again. Every time he comes out with a book, now I'm gonna know that I can't expect a McBride book, but 
it's absolutely a McBride book, if that makes sense. Like, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be awesome because he wrote it. So, yeah, five stars. Maybe we can get him working on that Koala Chlamydia book. <laughs> Just hanging out with, like, a pack of koalas or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. He can do a bunch of mushrooms and interview koalas about why they all have fucking chlamydia. <laughs> why do they keep giving monkeys chlamydia? Yeah, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> yeah, good stuff. Um, like I said, he is a definitely a pre-approved writer on this podcast, so we're gonna we're gonna review everything he has. Now, can I talk about some? Are we done? Are we done with Matthew McBride? Uh, I'll, well, I'm never gonna be done with Matthew McBride. For uh, purposes of this particular episode, I think so. are we done? We could say right. that, yeah. I would like to address something that happened just this afternoon. <laughs> um, we, uh, our video, our audio auto posts to YouTube as videos. They're just like the booked logo in the background. Rob and I were recently talking about how some of those actually get significantly more views. Like we, we don't do anything like it just it was like a button that Rob clicked at some point, I'm assuming, that sets it up to do that. So we don't expect to get listens on YouTube, but we do. And we get the occasional comment, which is great. We got what I think, at least on YouTube, was our first criticism today. <laughs> I think <clears throat> I think so. We'll let the listeners help kind of right. uh, help us make the decision what, what's actually happening here. So there is a gentleman that runs a YouTube channel called Big Hard Books and Classics. It's a ton of videos. Um, I scrolled through probably 40 or 50 videos uh, mm -hmm. and, and clicked in and kind of listened a little bit. And he talks about books and he does kind of some other stuff, I think, just kind of like vloggish, you know, stuff, it seems. He essentially, and I'm not going to read the whole comment, but it's available on our um, Kara Mori episode on YouTube if you want to go there and read it yourself. But he basically said that it was a bit of an unfair comparison um, that we uh, compared it to a previous novel that was written by Thomas Harris. And um, I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree. Um, <laughs> there are a t well, but there are a ton of writers that, that come out hot out of the out of the box and then never kind of return to their their splendor. And, and is it fair to compare it to their books? Well, we review books. I guess we kind of are okay with comparing it to whatever we'd like. But I understand his criticism his criticism there. And ultimately, he said he also has criticisms of the novel, but that we did not do a fair nor realistic review in his opinion. So I want to thank Big Hard Books and Classics for offering his opinion. Um, I mean, reviews are just that, man. They're they're my take. They're Rob's take on something. So I don't know if if there's a way to unfairly or unrealistically review a book. I'm gonna go with no. Um, <laughs> as I well, but I mean, as I frequently defend, what do I do? I defend people who love books that we think are garbage, right? Yeah. So I feel like I should be able to defend ourselves when we think a book is is not very good um but either way thank you for the input and if you want to check out any of his videos big hard books and classics on youtube i'm sure you have some thoughts too rob but i appreciate you letting me get through mine um i don't want to devolve into a criticism of this comment but i think the thing that i want more than anything is complete sentences like he gets halfway through a thought and kind of just ellipses into another thought. And I've said it before when, when someone has something that they want to tell us, the more specific information you can give us, the better that we can react to it. And, and the problem with the comment that we're looking at here is it's just scatterings of parts of thoughts. And so I would love to help, you know, grow the podcast into a better, apparently maybe more fair, thing than it is now but i can't i don't have anything to act on in this comment and it's a little disappointing because like i love like i said I th when we were talking about that itunes review where um someone didn't like the way we talked about women uh, i need specifics to know like well what was it that was something that was over the line here um i don't think that we were comparing it to other books first of all and so like that's that's something that is is I could see why he would say that because we talked about other Thomas Harris stuff, but I don't think that we, we reviewed it. I don't think that I was like, I gave it the stars I did because of how much, 
how less good it was than than other Thomas Harris books. He may have been referring to me saying that someone played on the success of oh, okay. Okay. Silence of the Lambs and then gave us a piece of garbage with Thomas Harris's name on it. That That's probably a little more directed at me than it was at you. Okay. But anyway, I guess when, if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, come, come to us with, you know, maybe something negative um, that you saw or heard us say or something like that, just give me as much detail as you feel comfortable giving so that like I can really think about it because this is, like I said, a series of half thoughts that don't really help me at all. I want, I want to like, I would love to have a discussion with big, hard books and classics about like, Hey, what, what made you react so strongly that you decided to comment on this, on this video? (laughs) And you know, what's fucked up though, is that we think that someone reacts strongly by commenting. You know why? Because our comment count is so low that if somebody comments <laughs> anything, we're like, stop Whoa. the presses. Yeah. Did you hold on? <laughs> Something happened. Well, also it's um, because I don't, I don't need your comment on things, and maybe maybe people do, but if I'm gonna if I'm gonna wade into any kind of conversation, even if it's like something a video that no one has commented on, um, I'm gonna be sure that like, what I'm doing is contributing to to something, not just firing off you know my my first impression of whatever i just watched or whatever that's true i'm not much of a commenter either um but i honestly if you would have asked me a week ago how i would take a very critical review of one of our (laughs) reviews i would have said a lot harder than i actually did because i was like i'm actually glad that he shared his thoughts i don't agree with him i mean i do a (laughs) little bit like i said i get that first part about Comparing an author's two books, maybe there's something a little there, especially when there's 30 years in between the two. But, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I was a little stuck on fair and realistic reviews. So, well, they were, I mean, those were capitalized. Those words were capitalized. So maybe that's, that's true. That's very true. Yeah. Subconscious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, I guess. Thanks. Big, hard sure. books and classics. I, I, accidentally let one of the videos start playing when I was trying to like, f- like see who this person was, someone in Oregon or whatever. And, um, it sounded really weird. Did you watch any of his stuff? His, I'm assuming uh, him. Well, the one, the one starts auto playing. Cause you get to put one if you want, the, oh, like yeah. it's your, your, it's supposed to be like your trailer for your channel kind of thing. Yeah. And, but a lot of people, it's just like their latest, um, video. And yeah, it was like weird Dublin, I think music, something about, I don't remember. No, not really. I guess kind of bizarre. What I'm trying to say. But whatever. But I'll probably like, go back and check it out. There's some book stuff. So yeah. I like YouTube. I watch a lot more YouTube than I watch TV nowadays. Uh, that's honestly, I'm glad you said that because one of the things that I do is, um, like if I'm, cause I'll be reading, I'll just be sitting around the house reading or doing other stuff with the podcast or whatever. But when I'm eating, I just want something entertaining me while I'm eating. And so like, eh, eating doesn't take a lot of time. It doesn't, it's not like an episode of a TV show or like, you know, a movie. It's just like, yeah, 10, 15, 20 minutes, whatever. So that's when I'll just rock out some random YouTube channel stuff. What's the weirdest thing you've watched on YouTube lately? I mean, is there something that you watch that's a little offbeat? Um, I could probably see a history of what I watched, right? Oh, I can see a history of what you watch because you're fucking logged into the goddamn YouTube for book, <laughs> apparently. Yeah, I watch a lot of like, I watch, um, I, I've gotten hooked on, this is the weirdest thing. Um, there's like a GQ, no, Wired does it and GQ, they have these like where celebrities are on and they do something like they, they like read like Google autocomplete like searches for their name and stuff. I watch a lot of that. I watch some Ozzy Man. I watch yeah. movie review stuff. It's nothing. All of this. When I when I signed into YouTube so I could get yeah. the comment. Like the comment came through to my phone as like a <laughs> notification. But then when I was getting ready for the podcast, I was like, well, I want to just copy the comment, get the guy's name right and everything, you know, the channel name. And so I signed in. Of course, I had to like sign into the booked one. And I did. I saw Ozzy Man reviews. Yep. I saw, you know, like uh, honest trailers. And yep. <laughs> I was like, this is this is all Rob. I know exactly what Rob watches on YouTube, which I'm glad it's not like weird shit because there's a lot of weird shit on YouTube, too. I right. was just oh, listening yeah, yeah. to an article 
uh, or I was listening to a podcast where they were saying, and I could be getting this wrong, but there are some channels where really it's like you're watching a woman who's like playing with her kids or like watching her kids, but then it's like like nip slips and like <laughs> really like 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 short or like loose shorts, so you get like the panty peak. But it's all done under the the guise of, um, oh, I think I that you're watching someone play with their kid, is which that, sounds so fucking bizarre. I thought I heard something about um, YouTube having to crack down on the children's stuff because there was like some insidious things. It was um, yeah, that's a little different, but yes, that's telling a thing telling too. kids to kill themselves or something weird like that. This is different. Well, that was that thing. that was that whole Momo thing. Where, oh, like, in the Momo, middle of a yeah. kid's video, like, this really super creepy kind of, like, a creepy pasta creation would come out and, yeah, and, and you know, I'll tell kids to hurt themselves. And th- there's there's a lot of weird shit on YouTube. And there's so much content. Video content is really hard to filter. Because, you know, yeah. you can you can have AI, like, read articles for things, for foul language or suggestive or whatever. But when it's people acting out things in videos, I don't know that we have the technology to, you know skim through that i know they can pick up five goddamn seconds of a song that we're not licensed to use i'm aware of that (laughs) for some reason that they fucking figure out um to answer now i want to answer your question of what's the weirdest thing that you've watched on youtube recently Mm -hmm. i'm gonna have to say it's big hard books and classics (laughs) (laughs) nicely done (laughs) i am gonna make a recommendation Um, I, i know exactly how i got around to this channel um, and I'm not going to go into it. Just trust that it started out with one thing and then that leads to something else. But I've been watching a lot of a guy named Peter Draws. That's the name of the channel. And it's a guy named Peter who's kind of an unusual guy, but it's literally him doodling. And a couple days ago, I, I mean, I had it on like mostly in the background. Like I wasn't actively watching it, but I realized like three hours had gone by. Jesus and all Christ. I've been watching is his his videos. So uh, check out Peter Draws. Rob, you should check out Peter Draws. He's just this weird artist guy. And I, I could have him on in the background all day long. Also, it's amazing what he does because basically every video is done. Like someone will send him a pen. And he'll be like, oh, this this viewer sent me a package of these pens. I'll give you my thoughts on these pens. And then he draws some really elaborate kind of surreal, like his stuff isn't very realistic. It's all kind of weird, offbeat, alien looking, but he does it all like with one pen, like one color. Yeah. So, but, but he talks the whole time and he has the weirdest thoughts and and I just find him really soothing and enjoyable. So um, in the event in the event that big hard books and classics isn't your thing um check out peter draws on youtube that's going to be the one that's like secretly hypnotizing you and you're going to go on a killing spree or something it, honestly if anybody was doing that it could be this guy man i'm telling you i'm going to send you a link i'll find one short video for you to watch <laughs> and I'll, I'll send it directly to you but everyone should check out peter draws that's that's my my latest thing uh, that and somehow i got onto uh i again kind of the same thread right from that I somehow got on to bullet journaling. Oh, um, you know, who, Ryan, the marketing intern is, I think, big into that kind of thing. For, oh, for sure. I, I can totally see that. All I can tell you is if you watch some of these chicks at bullet journal, I'm sure they put whatever Ryan's doing to shame. These are some elaborate journals that are like beautifully drawn and they're like, it's art in itself. If that makes sense. Like it's yeah. so pretty to look at that. The, a page on their journal is like artwork. So I won't be bullet journaling. A, I have terrible handwriting, and I'm not super talented or creative with like decorating things. But yeah, bullet journaling videos are another way to kind of get yourself some eye candy that was uh, <laughs> rather unexpected. It's just not something I expected to watch and be like, "Ooh, look at this! This is something." So, so. have you heard of field notes? Sure, I actually have. Uh, I have a couple of field notes pocket journals. Did you know? This is something I discovered from uh, Ryan. That there are like field notes meetups. That's a little weird. So there are people out there who are notebook enthusiasts to the to the extent that like they go to meetups to to like talk about notebooks. It's a real thing, and apparently it's pretty popular. 
Um, and so Ryan, Ryan's gone to these, he's gone to these like notebook meetups and stuff. And like, sometimes I think that there's the opportunity to get, um, get notebooks there. Like the, like field notes and stuff will, will participate. Field notes is in Chicago. Okay. Yeah. And he, Ryan was telling me about this. Uh, he got a really rare, like one of the first ever created field notes notebooks. and, And it was like, everybody was drool it was like a random drawing or something like that where he just got a, a random prize and he got this one notebook and then people were like oh my god that's so you know and it's so there's a whole community just around these little like thin notebooks yeah they're they're um they're nice <clears throat> there's usually like a little field notes one in like my bag my vape bag i carry around with me just <laughs> in case i have to like jot stuff down yeah um it is interesting though cuz people do pay a lot of money for little little folded up pieces of paper essentially <laughs> like yeah. it's, it's it's it gets into that thing and this probably is what happens with you and beer right like you start why start watching something i watch something else the next thing you know i'm looking at notebooks like videos on notebooks that are like 45 bucks and i'm like nodding <laughs> my head up and i'm like yeah oh yeah i can see that oh they're pre-numbered that's pretty cool. You know what I mean? Where yeah. you get sucked into this lifestyle. Yeah. Field notes is in Chicago. So I wouldn't be surprised if they, um, you know, try to sponsor, um, enthusiast events in yep. the area. I'm trying to think when I was down there and I was somewhere that I'm not normally at, I actually drove right past their, their place. And I was like, Oh look, there's the field notes like building. Hmm. So, but yeah, hmm. field notes. Yep. Yeah. Beer. I think I'm coming out the other side of the beer enthusiast thing since you brought it up where uh there's so there's this brewery that uh it's like one of these big hype breweries and they release um they have a series of you know four or five different beers that they release you know at specific times of year in limited quality excuse me in limited quantities and immediately they are being resold for like if you paid 30 bucks for the bottle at the brewery which that sounds like a big number right yes it does 30 bucks for a bottle of beer Mm-hmm. they're reselling for $900 and <laughs> like immediately. And <laughs> there was this fucking hilarious debacle where, um, uh, that brewery, it's called toppling Goliath. And they have like some of the most sought after stouts in the world, uh, currently. And they released a 10th anniversary stout kind of un- unannounced, um, where, you know, people just, you know, showed up one day and, oh, they, you know, they lined up and they started buying these things because usually it's a very controlled release where it's announced ahead of time and you buy tickets and you line up and all this stuff. And this was, from what I understand, very, like, last minute, just, you know, first come, first serve till it's gone kind of thing. And people were just buying the shit out of it um, with the understanding that there was, like, 160 bottles or something total and they were putting them up for just ridiculous amounts of money to, to resell. But it turned out that the quantity of bottles was closer to a thousand. <laughs> and so the valuation fucking plummeted. And mm-hmm. People were freaking out about it. And like all of a sudden they were counting on getting thousands of dollars from these six bottles they bought. And they, maybe they scraped together like a couple grand, which still sounds like a lot of money, but like, yeah, it was a big, and it, I just sat back and watched the whole thing. It was really funny. I mean, I wonder how many other <clears throat> instances there are of things like that. So um, I know there are, there are, whatever, like there are pen companies, right, that'll do, oh, here's a special edition. Here's the fall edition of our pet. It's only going to be available for three months. And yeah. then, you know, enthusiasts and stuff buy them up. But they buy it. They're all like regular price. Here's just the special one that we're doing. Mm-hmm. Like, I wonder how many people sit around companies and try to think of ways to make that beer thing happen where they're like, all right, so we've got beer that let's, let's be honest, a bottle of beer should be five bucks, but we could sell this motherfucker for 30 and then people are going to resell it for even more. So maybe we can get away with selling it for 40 or 45. You know what I mean? Where they're looking to mark up their stuff enough because of the secondary market. Um, Cause I, I feel like, if you can figure that shit out and it doesn't matter who you are. And I know that people line up for limited edition Legos when they come out and there's a variety of things. We were uh, Nike sneakers, right? We were yeah. talking about that ad nauseum for the last couple of months. Um, <clears throat> I wonder if there are people at companies that are hired to just think of ways to create that, that product. Hype sales. Yeah. I mean, 
Yeah. It, it's, yeah, it's ridiculous. And, and I'm super glad that I'm starting to not care about that stuff too much. Um, because the reality is, and this is the same with anything with like, you know, your Yeezys and shit like that. There's stuff that you can buy. That's a normal price. That's maybe 80% as good as the thing you're spending thousands of dollars on. Yeah. And so like, at some point you read this, reach this threshold of, um, I it's it's I understand how ridiculous this hobby is, and I'm I am no longer interested in it. I think I'm kind of getting to that point now, mm-hmm. but I'm already replacing it. Oh, hold! On. I want to say one <laughs> thing before I hear the replacement. The thing for me that I always looked at and listening to you and Jesse talk about this because you two are my like beer aficionado friends right. is um, if it was me, I would keep drinking beer until I found that beer that's the one. And then that would be all I drink. Like that's kind of my my mo. That's, Does that make sense? Yeah, hundred percent. And that's pretty much where I'm at. Like, yeah. I've tried all of like the not all of, but I've tried so many of the best of the best kind of things, and the like regular everyday normal of the of the same varieties to know kind of what the spectrum of good to not good is for any given thing. That like I know I know what my taste is now, and I can just kind of settle into that. So that's exactly, you know, I did that, but by spending a ton of money. Gotcha. All right. Please, please tell me about the new thing. Oh, it's used books. I don't know if you've noticed. No, I've noticed. I mean, (laughs) I, I mean, I I feel like you've kind of always been that way, but like that game is amped up. Must be all that money you're saving from not buying $50 bottles of beer. (sighs) Yeah. Um, and that's the thing, like go to a used bookstore. Um, if I spend 30 bucks, that's a lot of money. Um, go to a liquor store. If I spend 30 bucks, it's like I left a lot of stuff behind because I didn't feel like spending money. So right. yeah, yeah. really dialed down the quantity of money I'm spending. But like, it's just kind of fun to like wander around a bookstore and run into, oh, this is a, you know, this is a first edition of, you know, an author, author that we've really enjoyed. And so I've been building up my collection of, I'm really focusing on either getting books that we've reviewed or getting other books by authors that we've, uh, we've interacted with on the podcast. Can I ask a question? Cause yeah. you sent me a picture. You picked up a copy of the 50 years sword by Mark Z. Daniel Yep. <sighs> Refresh my memory here. Cause that came out in a very limited run when we reviewed it. Did it come out in paper again? Cause I know we both did the, yes. the, the digital. Okay. So, cause I thought about that and I didn't think about it. For like two hours after you sent me that picture, I was like, "This son of a bitch, pick up one of those limited edition fucking books." No, this this is the re-release, and okay. um, uh, it did not come with a dust jacket, so I kind of, I kind of impulse bought that one just because I'd never seen a copy of it, like you know, uh, in, in a bookstore. Um, but it doesn't have a dust jacket, so that kind of kills the value of it. It's just nice to have laying around. Only because this is in keeping with what you said and because it will be, again, a way for me to say um, or, or to prove my uh, my gratitude. Um, I actually ordered a copy of Shadow, The Shadow of the Wind, a paper copy of Ooh. The Shadow of the Wind. That's how much I like that book. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, I have a bookstore story from the other day if you if you want. <laughs> I would love to hear a bookstore story. This is a pretty quick one, so I know that we're probably wrapping up in a minute. But um, if you remember... Um, uh, back to an earlier episode, I explained that I bumped into a guy from school, uh, at, at a bookstore. Does that sound familiar? Yes, it does. Yep. And I told the story of how he didn't take his socks off when he was running into the mm-hmm. middle school shower. Uh, so that was the Livius. You'll understand this. So that was in Vernon Hills. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in the Niles, um, half price books, which is easily 40 miles from. Yeah. Vernon Hills. Yep. Guess who I ran into? I'm going to take a stab at that same kid guy. I guess he's not a kid anymore. He was a kid. Yeah, that same guy. And uh, so it was even more awkward because then I was thinking about him falling in the shower as I was talking to him. And mm-hmm. so like I was like, I can't. And there's nothing. We didn't have anything to talk to each other about. So it was a very brief interaction. I was standing in front of a bunch of Stephen King books. and <laughs> Dude, you had uh, everything to talk to him about. Be like... On my podcast that people listen to from all over the world, I was just talking about that time in middle school. 
What if no? No, because no? I, I would never bring it up to him. Because what if it's one of those like weird twisted memories where like I got the people reversed and I was the guy that fell in the shower? Oh. I'm not ready for that reality. I think we have to, <laughs> next time you run this guy in a bookstore, I think we have to have him on because I think <laughs> we might need to investigate a little bit into this, uh, this, um, um, what are those called? Like created memories, false memories or yeah. whatever. Like you might be suffering from false memory. We should look into this. But you wouldn't be able to trust either of us because both of us could be having the false memory. We'd need a th- impartial third, uh, witness. Second witness? Sounds like the, Whatever. It sounds like the plot to the worst fucking book ever. Oh my god. I know. So anyway, saw that guy again. And um, he, yeah, he actually later on sent me a, a, on Facebook a link to uh, a bookstore that's like about three hours south of here that like apparently is just very well spoken of. So if I ever get ambitious, I might take a little road trip. You're so, going to fucking do that for sure. This is your new thing. Yeah, sending me pictures of books that you purchased. Well, I only send you the pictures of the books that you'd appreciate. Oh, oh, oh! Well, I uh. did pick up a, a first edition hardcover of the Stupidest Angel in my last adventure. Uh, such a good book. Yeah, such a good book. So, yeah. Speaking of books, we're going to review a book next week. Um, oddly enough, longtime listeners will understand. Um, how bizarre this is we actually have it's got to be over a dozen books scheduled right now right yeah it's insane there's 14 if i'm if i if i remember correctly 14 books this has never happened in the history (laughs) of the podcast typically we have like like one scheduled for the next two or three weeks and then maybe one like two months from now and then we're scrambling usually right after we record an episode so if at any point at the end of an episode you don't hear us say what we're reviewing next it's because we have no fucking idea. And then we spend an hour after this trying to figure it out. Next week, we are reviewing The Grand Dark by Richard Cadry. Um, Richard Cadry is the author of the Sandman Slim series, a series of books that I read and enjoyed um, up until we started doing this podcast, at which time I stopped reading books for enjoyment at all, basically. And uh, I, I read the stuff that we review. Sometimes it's enjoyment, sometimes it's not. But it's a standalone novel from him, and uh, I'm pretty excited about it. I mean, I've, I've started it. Um, I'm looking forward to talking about this one. So very excited to, that Rob will be getting his first taste of Kadri next week. Yeah, it's very exciting. Um, and yeah, lots of stuff on the horizon. So um, and it's all stuff that it's just good, and like most of it, I'm really looking forward to digging into. So. Um, that means I'm going to fill the rest of those slots with absolute garbage because uh, that's fun too. So it's true. Yeah, that's the thing. We have to find a counterbalance. So we'll mm-hmm. figure that out. Um, I feel like that's wrapping it up for this episode. Yeah, I would say that wraps it up uh, for this episode. Uh, thanks again for listening. Um, check out Matthew McBride's new book. Check out Big Hard Books and Classics. Check out Peter Draws. And uh, come back and check out this podcast again. Until the next time, I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep watching big, hard books and classics.